Hello, this is Kyle, also known as Alien Tube. Today I am reviewing this Dark Sword Armory Gothic Two Handed Sword. Now, I bought this sword secondhand from my friend Kane Shen, and he did a video about it. You can check in the description, I'll put a link there to it. This sword sells new for $640. It comes blunt and with a pretty basic scabbard. Sharpening adds $30, and if you want the scabbard to have an interlaced belt, that adds an additional $95. If you don't want the scabbard at all, you can contact Dark Sword Armory and they will knock $60 off the price of the sword. So you can guess that the scabbard costs $60. And with that pricing in mind, this is no scabbard and sharpened by DSA. So that brings the price to $610 for this sword. Incidentally, this sword was ordered in late 2020 for $375. That means over the course of three years, that's an almost 80% increase in price. All right, so Dark Sword Armory. I'll probably refer to them as DSA during this video at some point. There's a lot of information out there about them in the community and a lot of strong opinions about Dark Sword Armory. I want to say right up front during this section, a lot of what I'm going to be talking about is speculation and educated guesses. Because there, while there's a lot of information, there seems to be a lot of controversy about DSA. And just, it's hard to tell where the truth is and where things are made up. So. Keep that in mind, this whole section is going to be, it's, it's going to be speculation. That's the best way to put it. So first off, what we do know absolutely is that Dark Sword Armory is based in Canada. They say that they make their swords in Canada, but I'm not sure they do. I think they import the vast majority of the swords I think they assemble them, but I think the blades, the hilt components, I think they import all of those. They might make something like the grips, but I don't believe that they make the hilt furniture or the blades. And there's a few reasons for this. First off, if you look at this Canadian website, they recognize Dark Sword Armory as an importer of swords and sword parts, not a producer. Also, if you pay attention to Dark Sword Armory through the years and what people get from them. There's a wide vi variance of specs and quality and it's in the same models you'll get. I've seen people who have this very specific model who say that it weighs over four pounds. This one is two pounds, 12 ounces. That's a huge difference. And to me, it doesn't make sense if they were making their own stuff to have that big of a variance. To me, it, it makes more sense that they are importing the components and putting it all together themselves. My hunch is that they sign contracts with forges, I'm guessing India, and once the contract is up, they put out to bid for a new contract to whatever forge that makes the gives them the best offer so one forge might make the swords lighter one might make it heavier it's it's there's a lot of variance there and to me that makes sense to explain that variance again speculation here and i want to say it is perfectly fine for dark sword armory to import the hilt components import the blade uh, do the assembly themselves there's nothing wrong with that business model just own it. Don't imply that you hand make your swords by hand in Canada because it doesn't seem to be true. Don't be dishonest, just own your business practices. So another bit of controversy about DSA is their hilt construction quality. For a time there, I think it was around a decade ago, they had a big problem where they were threading the pommels onto the tang and just not doing solid hilt construction. By pretty much all, or at least most of the reports I see these days, they fixed that. I hope that's the case because you do, for this price range, you really do want solid hilt construction. DSA also sends a lot of swords out for, as review samples to YouTube channels. 
And I'm not just talking about the big channels like Scalagrim, Matt Easton, and the like. I've seen them send samples to very small review channels, which is cool. That's a nice thing to see because, you know, not everybody gets a chance to get a review sample. And full disclosure, I reached out to DSA asking if they wanted to provide me a D, uh, review sample, and they never responded. And that's fine. They don't owe that to me. I have no problem that they didn't decide not to do that. No big deal there at all. However, what I find curious is that in all of the review samples to YouTube videos that I have seen, I've never seen much in the way of quality problems. I've seen some things like sharpness kind of lacking, but the quality problems that DSA seems to have somewhat of a repu reputation for never seem to show up in the YouTube review samples. Whereas people who are not sent review samples who buy their swords around the same time as review samples do end up with quality control issues. And those two paths never seem to cross. And that sends up a bit of a red flag to me. My speculation here, and again, this is pure speculation, I have no real evidence for this, is that Dark Sword Armory puts extra quality control into their review samples. Again, pure speculation here. Take it with a big grain of salt. This sword seems to be inspired by Oakshot Type 18s, in particular Type 18A and 18B. For my personal thought process, I think this leans a bit more towards 18B with a very longer blade and a longer hilt than is often seen on 18As. 18Bs were used most commonly during the mid to late 15th century into the early 16th century, so very late medieval and into the early Renaissance. They were cut and thrust balanced swords, and some of them would be more focused on cutting, some of them more focused on thrusting, depending on the geometries of the blade. You know, typology is not an exact science, and there's a wide variety of swords that can fit into the same typology. These types of swords were usually either of flattened diamond cross-section or hollow ground, which this DSA is, and 18Bs usually had a reinforced tip, which this one does not have. The hilts of these later medieval swords have definitely evolved into more elaborate hilts than you would typically see on the early medieval, where you would have oftentimes just a very simple cross guard and a very simple wheel pommel. Not always, of course, there were highly decorated swords from early, earlier medieval period also. Going through the different hilt components, let's start with the grip. This is a hexagonal grip, and it's your typical wood core leather wrap with a cord texture. The hexagonal grip is pretty decent, although I find that the central ridge right here is just a little more prominent than I would like. I would like it if it were flattened just a little bit and not quite so wide in this dimension. It's not a big deal. It's more of a preference thing. It's just my preference. And since this is a review of my opinions on it, I'm going to mention it. Now, the there's four risers here and they're pretty well done. They're nice and crisp and they're well placed. They actually help make up for that slight dislike, uh, that's that's too strong of a word. It's not even a dislike of the grip shape. It's just my preference is a little bit different. But they do help me keep my hands in place and give me a good sense of where the sword is. The grip is actually probably the best part of the hilt here. The seam along the edge here is pretty straight and relatively well done. I can feel it if I'm moving my fingers here to feel it, but when I'm gripping the sword and swinging it, I don't feel it. It doesn't look like it was skived though. That's where you take the two ends of the leather and you kind of thin them out and overlap them. And it makes for a straighter and less prominent seam. It doesn't look like that was done here. And it could be improved. That's something that I think could be improved, but it's not a big deal. There are a few places where the leather is wearing a little bit. No big deal there either. And if you look at the transitions, they are, you, if you look close, you can see some epoxy leaking out, which is something that kind of a recurring theme with this hilt. 
The pommel on here is a fishtail and a pretty good sized one. It's large enough and the sword overall is light enough that I kind of wonder if this pommel might be hollow a little bit. I don't know, just a, a thought. It's finished in kind of a bright polish that still has some grind lines and tool markings visible, especially in the more detailed parts of it, like in these curves and then this groove down the center. The polish is decidedly less bright there. There is some patina in a few different spots here, and it was like that when I got the sword, and I haven't bothered to clean it up because it doesn't really bother me. The corners have all been chamfered beautifully. This is a very comfortable pommel to grip, which I really appreciate because while this is a longer grip, it's still not really long enough to grip in two hands without at least getting some onto the pommel. And if I want to bring my hand down like this, the pommel rests in my hand very comfortably. So that's very good design. I really do appreciate the design and the finish work there to make these edges, which are pretty crisp, not sharp at all. Now, the transition to the grip, in a couple places, the pommel does overlap the leather a little bit, and that could create a hot spot. I never actually felt a hot spot. I never bit into my hand, but it, the potential is there. The pommel appears to be peened, and I say appears because I have a few questions about it. First off, Dark Sword Armory does have a reputation for having some threaded tangs and not having peened pommels, but it really does seem like they have fixed that from most of the reports I have seen. And this one, you can see a few errant hammer marks on the pommel itself, which certainly implies a peen. However, if this is a peen, it's not a good one because it's only overlapping the pommel in like one or two places, like here and here. And there's big voids here. And if you look at those voids, they are visibly full of epoxy. And epoxy is not a substitute for a tight fit in a grip construct or hilt construction. You want that peen to really compress the entire hilt down and do that with the peen, not with epoxy filling gaps. And I'm going to show you a picture here of another Dark Sword Armory sword that I saw posted on Facebook. It was around a year, a year and a half ago. I can't find the post anymore. I don't know who took this picture, but I saw it and I saved the picture because it was so glaringly bad. This this quote unquote peen is not even there. It's surrounded by a void. I th This thing can only be held on by epoxy. So this is a relatively new sword from Dark Sword Armory. Like I said, it was around a year to a year and a half ago and just unacceptable of a peen. Luckily, this one is not like that. And the pommel is completely tight. I don't have any wiggle there at all. The cross guard here has come slightly loose. I can't show it because it's not loose enough to actually see it visibly. But if I do this, I can feel just a little bit of wiggle. What's where, How it's easier to tell, though, is in the sound. If I am testing the percussion nodes on the sword, you can hear it. And check this out. This is where you can hear it. That rattling you hear there is the cross guard. At least I hope it's just the cross guard. I really hope it's not the tang rattling against the grip, uh, the wood of the grip or anything else, because if it is, this hilt has an incredibly short lifespan. Once the tang is loose and not securely held against everything, the, the hilt construction needs to be completely redone. I hope that's not the case here. Now, aside from the looseness here, this cross guard is finished much the same as the pommel. You can see some tool markings here and there. It's a little shiny of a finish, but not a full on mirror. It's a little not wide enough. I, I'm not sure the correct terminology there, but it feels like the quillins could be extended about that much, like about a full inch. This is a little bit 
not wide enough for a Type 18B. This looks more like what you'll see on a lot of Type 16A swords, which tended to have not particularly wide cross guards, but Type 18B, generally speaking, had pretty wide cross guards. Now, all the corners here are chamfered very well, just like the pommel. There's no hot spots here at all, except for this very weird triangular protrusion that is perpendicular to the blade. I have no idea what this design is for. You don't see it on any historical swords, and it presents a lot of problems with handling. And we'll get into that during the handling section. Now, while recording this, I just noticed that I can very slightly make out the cross guard shake moving a little bit. If I wiggle it, I don't know how well that's going to be caught on camera, but it is very slightly noticeable. And while I've got this here, the cross, the gap in the cross guard is huge. They made absolutely no effort to shape it to the blade. Not a big deal because historically the gaps in cross guards range the gamut from huge gaps to very tight ones. However, just like other parts of the hilt, if you look into the gap, it's filled with epoxy. And again, you shouldn't need epoxy to make your hilt construction tight. You should have a tight hilt construction by everything fitting together well, by having the the groove or the the slot in the grip shaped to the tang, by having the, the pommel slotted and keyed to the tang. All these things should be done to Make it so there's no voids in the in the entire hill construction that need to be filled by epoxy. You might also be able to see here that the gap is about a millimeter or maybe even a bit more larger on one side of the sword than the other. It was big enough of a difference that I was wondering if the sword is not actually centered on the tang. So I took some measurements and the quillings are basically the f exact length um, from the center of from the blade. So that doesn't appear to be the case. However, the sword definitely is not perfectly flat in the cross guard gap either. I'm gonna to try to show that very slight cross guard wiggle here. Yeah, I can definitely see it from back here. Hopefully the camera is capturing it. And now it's time to talk about the business end, the blade. As always, here's my measurements. So this is a very long blade at just over 29 inches. It starts at a little bit over 1.8 inches wide and has a gentle and even profile taper for most of the blade before transitioning into the ogive curve of the tip. The blade is 6.3 millimeters thick at the guard with interesting distal taper. For the first six inches, it tapers about half a millimeter, but then the next six inches it drops a full millimeter before slowing back down to a more even reduction in thickness ending at 2.8 millimeters, 36 inches up the blade. When looking at close-ups of this sword, you might notice a bend in the blade. This is the best picture I was able to get that shows it. This bend came from a bad cut, which we'll get to in a little bit, but that bad cut also caused the cross guard looseness. The sword is deeply hollow ground with quite the prominent central ridge. Now, the central ridge at first glance and from afar looks very straight, but when you get a little bit closer, and you really start inspecting it, you see it does waver around a little bit, and that wavering is mostly due to the rippling in the sword, which there is a lot of it. But the rippling is not really a problem. It's not deep ripples, so it's not affecting the functionality of the sword, but it does detract from the appearance a little bit. Not a lot, but it could be cleaned up some. And the blade is polished to a pretty similar finish as the cross garden hilt, which is kind of a shinier finish that is not truly a mirror polish. There are a good number of scuffs and some grind lines and even a few spots of oxidation from when the sword first got to me that I haven't bothered to clean up because they don't really bother me. The tip on here is not reinforced. I would like to see it reinforced, but not a big deal. It's pretty well formed, although there's a little bit of asymmetry here and there. Not a big deal. Now, throughout this review, I've had some criticisms and some harsh words here and there for different parts of the sword. But unfortunately, as we I move into the edge beveling, this review is going to turn decidedly negative. 
the edge beveling here is terrible. It's got a very prominent secondary bevel that is an obtuse angle that is in no way conducive to cutting, and it's just not sharp, as you'll see in a moment in the paper cutting test. It's just a poor edge on this sword. The previous owner, Kane Shen, did some work on one of the edges. He refined it a little bit, but he didn't spend a lot of time on it. I can definitely tell that there is one edge that's sharper than the other, but both edges still need a lot of work. This is a $30 sharpening job by DSA, and it is not worth that price. It's not worth $5 to have it sharpened like this. It's not sharpened. All right, I'm gonna test the edge on some paper. As always, I expect the sword to be able to slice in from the edge and cut cleanly through the paper. So it completely failed there. Let's try a few times. Not there, it actually bent the paper. I got one cut into the edge there in one spot, but then it started tearing very quickly. Yeah, so there's one spot that is sharp enough to start the cut right around here, and then it kind of tears through it with a little bit of cutting, but mostly tearing through most of the blade. Let me get another piece of paper and I'll try the other edge. All right, we're going to test the other edge here. One slight bite in and then just nothing but tearing. Yeah, no, nothing but tear, or not even cutting in there. So I got one cut right near the tip there, and then pretty much nothing else. One more time, I'm gonna start at the tip again. So every now and then the sword is sharp enough to slightly bite into the edge and then it will kind of draw through and kind of cut. It's a very jagged and rough cut that's not quite a tear. Generally speaking, the sword is not sharp enough to cut into the edge of paper and just feeling the edge, it doesn't feel sharp. I can run my fingers along it and it doesn't feel I don't feel like I'm going to get cut at all. This just is not a particularly sharp sword. Let's take a look at some cutting footage. Now, I did not do very much cutting with this sword. Why is that? Because, to put it bluntly, this is the least fun sword I have ever cut with. It is miserable. The edge is in no way conducive to cutting and having fun with it. There's also some issues with the flexibility and thickness of the sword. But before I get into that too much, I want to make abundantly clear, I am by no means an expert cutter. I am average at best. However, I think there is real value to showing what an average cutter can expect out of the sword, out of any sword, because the vast majority of people who watch the reviews are going to be average or at best. You know, not everybody can be an expert cutter. Yes, it's great to see what expert cutters can do. You can see what a sword can do in, in hands of people who really know how to use it. But it's also instructive to see what it, how a sword handles and reacts to somebody who is not does not have perfect edge alignment all the time who is not has not honed their technique for years on end and i think that's where i can provide some pretty good value i have a decent amount of experience cutting now but this doesn't come particularly naturally to me and i am never going to be an expert cutter and you know, I have enough experience at this point that I'm able to get some pretty decent cuts from time to time. Not all of them, of course, and I definitely flub cuts, but I can get decent cuts fairly regularly. Not the case with this sword. I could not get anything with this sword. I batted bottles around the yard. 
I tore the heck out of bottles. Occasionally I would get cut, a cut all the way through, but the, even then the bottles would be torn up. Just a miserable experience cutting with this sword. Now on a positive note, on one of my cuts I had some pretty bad aim and I hit the stand and took a small chunk out of it. The good thing is the sword took no damage from that. It handled that bad cut fine, it didn't give me any hand shock, and it stayed completely straight. I made sure after doing that cut that there was no bend and there wasn't yet. All right, so let's talk about that bad cut that I mentioned earlier that caused the bend in the blade and the cross guard looseness. This is on a two liter soda bottle. These targets are certainly tougher than the small water bottles I normally cut, but they're not particularly tough as long as you avoid the neck and the cap. If you cut in the middle, they're relatively easy targets to cut. Well, when I swung here, my edge alignment was certainly off a little bit. There's no denying that, but it's not off by a ton. I have had other swords that I've cut with where, with this kind of edge alignment and it cuts all the way through. Not the case here. You can see here in slow motion, the sword is flexing like crazy in multiple places. And it also delivered a lot of hand shock to my upper hand, my, my right hand. And we'll get to that when we talk about the percussion nodes in the handling section. But it completely failed this cut. And there's a few reasons for that. First off, the sword is not sharp enough. So that is a big problem when you're cutting targets and your edge alignment is off a little bit. Secondly, the sword is pretty thin and flexible. And when you're dealing with a more thin, flexible sword, you need a sharper edge and you need good edge alignment. With the fact that I had uh, an edge that is in no way sharp enough and relatively poor edge alignment, combining that with a sword that is very flexible, just is the perfect storm to have a terrible cut. And this was a terrible cut. And I think it'll be instructive to look at another follow-up cut on this target where I actually did get through. My edge alignment was good enough to get all the way through the bottle. But if you look at the bottle afterwards here, it's torn the hell out of the plastic. That is not a clean cut. That is one of the worst tears through a bottle I have experience with. Now let's look at this milk jug cut. I did a double cut here. This is something I've been trying to do to showcase both the speed at which the sword can be moved and how easily it can, you can follow up a cut and also just to improve my own skills. You can see the first cut looks pretty decent and then the second cut just bashes the bottle, the jug aside. What happened here? Well, when I did that first cut, the sword felt like it was dragging through the milk jug, which made me think the sword was further back in the cut than it actually was, which just completely messed up my confidence in the second cut and my edge alignment was off because of that. Mostly, that's my fault for not having proper edge alignment. However, the sword gave me feedback that was just not good. It did not feel like it was cutting well, and that led to the bad cut. But something else I want to point out here, and let's go frame by frame here. Look at how much the sword is flexing while swinging it in the air. And not just how much it's flexing, where it's flexing. To me, it looks like the flex is starting about a third of the way up the blade just from swinging in the air. Part of that is probably flexing from cutting through the first target and it's kind of still flexing as I'm moving it into the second cut. But I've never seen a sword flex this much for this much of the blade after cutting a target like a milk jug and just moving it through the air. That's a lot of flex, and it doesn't inspire confidence in cutting with this sword. And that's all for cutting. I didn't do any other targets. I didn't bother with pool noodles because if it can't cut water bottles, I don't expect it to cut a pool noodle. And I am certainly not wasting a tatami roll on a sword that I know I am not going to be able to cut it with.
Now it's time to talk about the handling of this sword and do some comparisons to other relatively similar swords. First off, at 2 pounds 12 ounces, this is a light sword, especially for something with a 39 inch blade. That is a long blade and a light weight for a long sword. And it is balanced right around three and a half, four inches, somewhere in there, which makes this a very agile sword. It is very easy to move it around and have good control over it. Although if you notice when I'm doing this, I imagine you'll notice because I'm noticing that the tip wobbles a lot. And that's because of just how flexible this sword is. You know, during the cutting section, I spent quite a bit of time talking about it. Let's just see what it takes when, what it does when I flex it. So I, that, this is not even full strength. This is very easy for me to flex this much. That's a little too flexible in my mind. And yeah, just too flexible to me. The good thing is it does flex in the right spot. You know, that's, that flex starts really about two thirds of the way up the blade. That's where you really want it to flex. And if you look at the vibration nodes, it's generally in a pretty decent spot here. However, it's not in a good spot in the hilt. It's more in the cross guard section rather than in right where I grip it. You generally want the hilt node to be right around where your upper hand grips it. And that can create some unfortunate hand shock on bad cuts. I talked about that during the cutting section as well, so I'm not going to belabor it anymore. But yeah, very light sword, very easy to move around. It really does not feel like it has a 39 inch blade. It doesn't, I would not guess that just picking it up and moving it around that it's that long, except that, you know, when I'm holding it out here, like, good Lord, that's a long blade. <laughs> and I can move it around one handed very easily as well. And a large part of that is the fact that this is two pounds, 12 ounces with a relatively close point of balance. So it's definitely, usable one or two hands. Now, DSA calls this the gothic, the two-handed gothic sword. I think it would be better called a hand and a half sword because it really does feel like it's usable in one hand as well. Now, something I mentioned earlier during the hilt section is this protrusion on the cross guard. This is very problematic for European medieval sword techniques because a large variety of cuts of, in European techniques require thumbing the blade, where you actually support the blade some with your thumb. And this protrusion sticks right into my thumb and the joint there and does not feel good at all. If I were to, when doing the cut, if this were to impact at all, my hand would be, sh my thumb would, would be, the, the cross guard would be rattling and driving into my thumb and feel terrible. It, there, there's no good reason for these protrusions. You don't find them on historical swords and they shouldn't be here on this sword. This should be much more in line with the grip. If you look here, hopefully you can see that. It sticks way out above the grip and there is no reason for that. If this were just trimmed down to be more like a normal cross guard, it would improve the functionality of the sword a great, great deal and it's just wrong to have this protrusion here. All right, so my first comparison to the DSA Gothic is this Balor Arms Italian Longsword. This is the first generation of this model. And the, the Balor Arms weighs in at three pounds, two ounces. The DSA, again, tw two pounds, 12 ounces. So that's a six ounce difference, pretty considerable difference, especially when you consider the size difference here. The DSA is a much longer blade and about the same uh, hilt length. Let me put the DSA down. So when I pick up this sword, I definitely immediately feel that it is a shorter blade and it's more rigid throughout. I can, when I pick it up and just, just simply move it out here, I can see it wobbling a little bit, just kind of vibrating a little bit, but it doesn't feel like the way the DSA feels where you can really feel that wobble kind of traveling through the entire sword a little bit. This feels much more solid to me. And 
I think I got lucky on this one, honestly. I know other people have had swords of this maker, of this specific generation of this specific sword, and theirs were wildly too floppy and thin and flexible. This one is what I consider to be pretty much a perfect blade in terms of flexibility. And honestly, it's one of my favorite budget swords. This was around $200 to $300, something like that. It has a perfect blend of balance and blade authority. And let's see where it's balanced. It's actually balanced pretty close to the guard, closer than I remember, honestly, at about two inches. But I still have a good amount of blade presence out here. This is just, I think, a really well-designed sword. Let's pick up the DSA so I can see how it feels. Yeah, so when I pick this up, instantly notice it is definitely lighter. It has a bit more tip weight to it because it is so long. 39 inches is a very long blade, although not outside the realm of normal for a 18B, that's for sure. In fact, Albion's website says 18Bs would typically be 39 to 42 inch long blades, so you're talking really long blades there. But yeah, I pick this up, I can just feel the, the wiggle in the sword every time I move it around. And it, it doesn't have a ton different feel, but it's just slightly less authoritative. It has, which is interesting because it's further balanced out and I feel like it has tip weight, but it's so light that it doesn't feel like a sword. It feels more like a fetter, especially with how flexible it is and how the, uh, the wobble goes. It really doesn't feel like a sword to me. It feels more like a fetter. What I will say though is the, the pommel here feels absolutely great to grip. Much, much better than the Balor Arms Italian, which with that style of pommel sometimes does bite into the hands a little bit. This one, I have never had the slightest bit of problem biting into my hands. This is a really well-designed pommel for gripping. And here we have the DSA Gothic again, and here the Valiant Armory Vision Tower. Now, I did a comparison to the Balor Arms, a much less expensive sword. Here we have a comparison to a much more expensive sword. This is about double the cost blade alone to the DSA. And for that kind of price difference, do I expect the DSA to handle as well as the Tauber? No, I don't. The Vision Tauber is one of my sweetest handling swords. It's one of my absolute favorite swords. So there, there's just no real way for it to be able to compare as for the DSA to be able to compare to that at half the cost. However, it can be instructive to see what how good a sword can be and then compare it to a sword that maybe is lacking a little bit. And let's do a comparison of them side by side. Tauber is noticeably shorter in the blade. Hilt is a little bit shorter. The pommel is a lot smaller. I don't know how well that's gonna come across and show you there. Pommel is much, much smaller there. So I spent all that time talking about how light the DSA is, right? Well, the Tauber is almost identical. It is two pounds, 12 ounces. It's like 0.1 ounce difference, different from the Gothic Longsword. And I spent all that time talking about how the DSA is probably a little bit too light for my taste. Well, that's not the case with the Tauber. The Gothic Longsword feels to me floaty. It feels like it doesn't have much blade presence. It feels a little off. The Tauber is perfect. Like I said, this is probably one of my favorite handling swords of any sword I own or have ever handled. So it's no surprise I'm gonna say it's pretty much perfect. I love the way this feels. It has the perfect amount of blade presence and tip weight without being overly heavy. It is balanced right around four to four and a half inches. One of the things that this does though is it distributes the weight better than the DSA. The cross section here towards the hilt is hexagonal and it has a lot more weight here and that keeps the stiffness of the blade much, much better. It is a very stiff blade throughout most of it. I have to be careful because this is also very sharp. But 
it's not wobbly at all. If I hold it out here, it, there's a tiny, tiny, tiny bit of wobble, but really that's probably more of my hands not being perfectly still than the sword wobbling. And yeah, this is just so nice, so sweet. You can see the, vibr the percussion notes are very nicely placed. It's right in the, the hilt one is right where my hand is, right where you want it to be. This is just an incredibly refined design. And the DSA is a little bit less so. I'm gonna pick up the DSA now. So yeah, immediately, like I said, this feels floaty. It doesn't feel like there's a lot out there. I can feel the tip. There is some feel to the tip, but there's not really much feel to the middle of the blade and almost none at the hilt, at the cross guard. And that's because I think it starts at 6.3 millimeters thick, which is okay. It could be a little bit thicker, but it thins very quickly, too quickly in my opinion. And it's just not quite right for the design. But the entire hilt also feels a little bit lighter, which is interesting because like I said, the pommel on this is much, much smaller than the Taubers. And I believe the Tauber actually, is, the pommel on it actually is a little bit hollow. So that makes me wonder, is this pommel a little bit hollow? Is the hilt, is, is the grip not really fitted to the tang and it's so there's less wood and more epoxy there which would less lessen the weight a little bit i'm not sure but with how much epoxy is visible on this sword i wouldn't be surprised so this is not a terrible handling sword other than the fact that i cannot thumb the blade comfortably at all but it's not a terribly handling sword but it's just a little off it's a little too flexible, it's a little too light and le not enough blade presence. It's just a little bit off and it really drags down the feel of the sword because there's a lot of little things that add up to a sword that doesn't really have particularly pleasant handling for cutting. Now, if you're just going about doing forms, you know, just trying to do basic cuts, basic movements, it's pretty good except for the fact that you can't thumb the blade. You know, you could do basic cuts with it, but there's a lot of cuts that involve thumbing the blade. There's guard positions that you thumb the blade. It's an integral part of European swordsmanship, and it's not really possible with this sword. And that's a problem on a sword that, as I said, I believe DSA considers this to be kind of their medieval sword line. There are ones that are based on history. And this cross guard prevents a wide variety of historical sword techniques. Potential improvements. Where to even start here? Normally I identify three individual things that I can point to that I think would improve a sword. Here I'm going to instead identify three overall categories and then go into a little bit more detail on each of them. First up, the overall design of the sword. The blade, I think, needs a redesign especially. It starts at 6.3 millimeters thick, which is workable, but not with the distal taper it has. There's no way it should be down to 4.7 millimeters after just 10, 12 inches, something like that. Personally, I would like to see the sword beefed up to around seven and a half millimeters. In fact, here's the specs of the current distal taper. And here what is what I think should be done. Quite a big difference there. I think this would make the sword much stiffer and be more accurate to historical swords and just be overall a better sword like this. A second part of the overall design that needs to be improved is the cross guard. And there's a minor thing with it, and a major thing. The minor thing, extend the quillins a little bit. This is a little bit too short for uh, 18B cross guard, in my opinion, very minor. The big thing though is this protrusion on the cross guard. It has no business being there. It interferes with historical European martial arts techniques and it's bad. Get rid of that protrusion, just flatten out the cross guard, it would be a big improvement. And lastly, in this category, 
I think the grip could be just a little bit flatter, reduce the sharpness of the central ridge in the hexagonal section just a little bit. I like the hexagonal cross section. I just think it could use to be a little bit flatter. Very minor thing that is more my preference than anything else. The second big category of what is a failure on a sword is the sharpness. This is in no way an acceptable level of sharpness. You shouldn't have to pay extra for this level of sharpening because it's basically not sharpened at all. You know, I can run my fingers along the blade and have no fear of cutting myself. And, you know, a sword needs to be sharp enough to do that. We don't do it in modern day anymore, but that's what swords were designed to do. So if it can't do that, it's failing at its primary job. And lastly, the hilt construction, especially in the pommel, but just the entire thing. I, there's too much epoxy here. I think they used epoxy to fill a lot of gaps, and that is a shortcut to a good grip, a good hilt construction that is not a long-term solution. Epoxy comes loose, it breaks, and it's going to need to be redone at some point. And the peen on here, if it is a peen, it does look like it's peened, but it looks like a very sloppy peen. And it really should be covering the entire gap uh, in the pommel so that it's a solid construction. The entire hilt to me is not solidly constructed and that's showing in the cross guard being loose. And to me, I think it's likely that the epoxy in here is starting to come loose and break apart and it's going to get worse and worse. Bottom line, this sword costs $610. What do you get for that price? Well, you get a sword that absolutely nails the look of a late medieval European longsword, with the exception of this rather weird cross guard. You get a sword that from afar looks great. And even if you get close up, it really does look the part. It's not until you really start inspecting it that you start finding flaws. And unfortunately, those flaws really start adding up, especially in the hilt construction, the sharpness, the design. All those things I just mentioned in the potential improvements, they really do add up to becoming problems and honestly, serious problems. And at $610, this is firmly in the mid-range price for swords and I don't expect this many problems on a sword in that price range. I don't think this many problems is acceptable in a budget range sword, which is, you know, half the cost of this. For $610, I could get an Albion Squire line sword, and sure, I would have a 18, 24 month wait, something like that, but I'd be all but assured of a really well executed, very well thought out sword. And that's not what we have here. And it's just not worth it to my eyes. This sword has too many flaws for the price that they are asking. I, I can't accept them in a $600 sword. And aside from all that, one of the most important things for me for a sword is to be functional and fun to use. And this is not fun to use. It's one of the worst cutting swords I've ever used. I think it's the least fun sword I've ever used. And I just, I don't wanna pay money for a sword that I'm not going to want to take out to the yard and cut with or even practice with. And this fails at both of those. So yeah, I, I can't justify the price in any way, shape or form. Now it's important to say this may not be representative of, of all Dark Sword Armory swords. In fact, with their reputation for variance in their quality control, it's possible you'll get something better if you order from them. But for me, I don't think that's acceptable either. You're paying half a thousand dollars or more. You should be expecting to get something with consistent quality. And from everything I've seen of Dark Sword Armory, that is not something that they are good at doing. That's not their mo MO. They tend to have wild variants in the swords. 
from what I've seen. Again, this is my experience with this sword and from what I've seen online. I have to base my judgments based on that. I can't account for every possibility. So my experience with this sword tells me that I'm probably not going to buy another Dark Sword Armory sword. All right, I think I have rambled more than enough about this sword, so let's draw this review to a close. If you want to support the channel, check out my merch store at www.alien2.com. The link is in the description. While you're down there, hit the like button, leave a comment, and if you've somehow managed to watch this entire review and you haven't subscribed yet, what are you doing? Subscribe already! Help the channel continue to grow. Until next time, Alien2 out.